Welcome to another edition of Beyond the Album Cover of yours truly, Jarrell Mason, where I get the inside scoop from those in the know from entertainment and all walks of life and give them their flowers while they're here to be celebrated. With me right now, I have a woman who is a creative in the space of cinematography. And as we see in today's time with the likes of Lena Waite, Issa Rae, Tyler Perry, she's staking out her own claim with her production company, Shoes in the Bed, and there's a documentary that will be dropping on February the 22nd on PBS's Independent Lens, Mr. Soul, about the show Soul, which aired on NET slash PBS and is about her uncle, Ellis Hayslip, the one, the only Miss Melissa Hayslip. Welcome to Beyond the Album Cover. Hey, thank you, Jarrell. What a great intro. How you doing? I'm doing great. I appreciate you taking the time to come out and do this interview because when I first heard of the Mr. Soul documentary dropping, I knew I had to have you on the show. And Soul is definitely an important piece of African-American television history that should be known by everybody in the world. And it will be come the Independent Lens debut. Yes, thank you so much. It's so great to be here. Always a wonderful opportunity to talk about this show and this film. You know, Ellis Hazel was kind of like an unsung hero. And I think now is the time to really bring these voices forward because so much of our history impacts our present and our future. And it's important to know, you know, that there's always been Black excellence, and especially as we celebrate Black History Month. It's exciting to look back at some of the cultural pioneers who, and you know, the, we all stand on the shoulders of greatness, right? So yes, we this do. is a great story. Yeah, you definitely don't know where you're going till you know where you've been. And as of the taping of this podcast, it's on MLK Day. So what better way to yes. ring in Black History Month with telling this story and the truth behind it. So before we get into Mr. Soul, how did you get your start into filmmaking and what led that transition for you to go from Broadway to TV and film? Yeah, well, I had always loved film and I did come from a performing arts background, both an actress, singer and a dancer for many years. And I had worked in film. I was always fascinated by the story that you could tell. And I was more interested in what was happening behind the camera, to be honest, than in front of the camera. And so I moved to LA and I thought that was the best place to be in Hollywood to understand how the industry worked and I worked at the American Film Institute for a number of years um, in development. And that's where I really started to understand everything that go comes together. I started working on different film projects and worked my way up from you know, being in production to being in casting, to being in associate producing. And that's when I realized that as a director and a producer, you could really pull it all together and tell the story. So that's when I sort of transitioned into being behind the camera and was always looking to amplify the type of story that I felt was missing. So women's voices, people of color, our stories are so important, you know, and I started my own company for that reason. Um, wow, 2009, almost 11, 12 years ago. And I felt that there's some stories out here that are really worth telling. And there are so many emerging filmmakers and women filmmakers. And I thought, well, this is a great way to do two things at once, you know, to elevate and amplify and to also make the stories that I think are missing that we need to hear about. Yeah, exactly. Because I feel in today's current space, you don't necessarily need a gatekeeper to tell your stories for you because we see now with Tyler Perry, Lena Waite, Issa Rae, which Insecure yeah. was in after season five this year. And as opposed to back in the 90s and prior, where you had to go through your major studios in order to get your mm -hmm. stories told, unless you were someone like a Spike Lee, a John Singleton, or Hughes Brothers, where you were able to have the clout to say, I want to make the movie I want to make, but you're going to back it for yeah. me. So what is the you difference know, between so that studio system now and then? I think what's really changed everything is this digital era we're in, the virtual space we're in, the ability for people to not just create their own work, but to have a lot of different platforms to get their stories out. You know, we used to be really beholden to this this sort of formal idea of a studio. And we still are to some degree, but I think people started realizing that there are other ways to get their voice out. Like Issa Rae, she started out with a show online, you know, the misadventures of awkward of an awkward black girl. That wasn't the exact title, but you know, um, the adventures of awkward black girl. And 
that created a following and she created a brand because she had like this intimate following with people who were interested in her story. And then that got picked up by HBO and everything really, you know, snowballed in a great way for her. And I think in similar ways now, independent producers, directors, content creators, creatives, black creatives are realizing our stories are just as important. Our stories are just as, um, you know, will travel overseas and will get an audience. All this is really key to remember that our stories matter, <laughs> just like Black Lives Matter and, and Black creatives matter, that there is a, a universality happening, a shift in which there's, there's, there's room and we need to make room and, de de sorry, <laughs> I'm so excited, demand room for our stories to be told and to be heard. And so it creates a different kind of vibe where you might have to work harder to find a way to make your space, but it's definitely happening. It has a lot to do with the iPhone, you know, personal computers, every, everything that people can do to create their own studio, their own network, their own brand. It's like the, it's the time of the entrepreneur and it's like a perfect time for black creatives to get their stories out. Yeah, I definitely agree. And to quote Leslie Odom Jr., who portrayed Sam Cooke in One Night in Miami, directed by Regina King, which is getting Oscar buzz already. I don't want a piece of the pie. I want the recipe. That's right. I just read that yesterday. I love that quote. He's actually a friend of mine from way back in the Broadway days. And I just think it's so key. And, uh, you know, kudos to Regina King. She had such a wonderful premiere and everybody was tweeting about it. Like she had the whole community behind her, you know, and that's what we have to do is like, we have so much strength in numbers and we are so connected, uh, you know, black Twitter and everything we do to support each other. And I think that's what's beautiful about the black family. And as we celebrate, you know, Martin Luther King day that we really are a family and we really wanna see each other soar. And so we can come together to support each other, to be there the night that the film drops on Amazon, you know, to, to really participate and share the way we spread love on, you know, all our social platforms, all of that really matters. And it's really great that we're coming together that way. Right, and to quote Biggie, spreading love is not just the Brooklyn way, it's the human way. And with Virginia hey. King, She's been putting in work since her days as Brenda on 227, but it's just okay. now that the mainstream audience has caught on to what everybody within the African-American community has been knowing for years. And also, I'll be remiss if I didn't mention Donald Glover in Atlanta. Oh, yeah, man. I mean, like I said, folks have been out here forever and we are loyal, you know, we are loyal to our peeps. And so it's really great to see she's catching this wave of, of like, you know, mainstream. But like you said, we've been down for Regina since jump. So it's really, really wonderful. I'm so happy for her. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned briefly that you have a connection with Leslie Odom Jr. Can you tell me about what it's like for you to see his rise from Broadway, then the nationwide commercial to Hamilton, One Night in Miami, <laughs> and how he's just catching on now where people in the know have been knowing that this boy has been something since forever you know i saw him in productions in la a long time ago i did a i did a play reading with his wife nicolette way back when she was like still in high school you know we come from this community of theater and and supporting each other and leslie was in a production of once on this island you know at um gosh in at ucla and I went to see that. I saw him in uh, other productions and uh, he's just been so consistent. And it was just so exciting when just fought, when everybody caught up with him, you know what I'm saying? So that's kind of what the vibe is right now. There are all these great black creatives out here and the world is catching up to us. Just like I feel like the world is catching up to soul. You know, Ellis Hazlip is a pioneer from over 50 years ago. But what, he's do, what he was doing then and the revolution he started on television with inclusion, diversity and, and black power, that's what we need right now. Like that's the voice we need right now for the, to, to heal the soul of a nation, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's very exciting. It feels like, yes, it was always there, but the world is catching up to us. And I think that says a lot about not just this racial reckoning we're in right now, but the truth of, you know, 
of blackness, a black, the black nation. We are a nation of people, you know, and we're not separate from this great nation. We are this nation. Mm -hmm. And it Ooh, definitely takes a nation today. of what millions. You are giving somebody a word. The only thing that's missing is the church organ and the tambourine. Come on. Hey, hey! get your, get your shout here. on and all of that good stuff there. <laughs> now, within the circles of Hollywood with stage plays mm -hmm. and things of that nature, is it more yeah. of like if somebody books a part, it's more of, no, I'm going to keep it to myself or I'm going to refer you to somebody who maybe can look out for you. Whereas like Ace Boogie and Paid in Full, everybody eats. <laughs> everybody eats. Everybody eats. That's how it's. That's how we do. Because I think it's important. We're we are also connected. If we went to college, if we came up, if we have friends, you know, all of that is like imprinted on us. We never let go of that. I never let go of that. You know, I want to. When I think of the film, this film, Mr. Soul, it's taken over ten years to make the film, and so now that we're finally in a place where we can share it with the world. It's like, we want the soul to be the, you know, the tide that raises all boats. Anybody who is in the production, let's take it back to 50 years ago. Let's give props to these artists who were coming out, you know, the last poets, you know, these are people that have like with the f forefathers of hip hop, you know, the forefathers of hip hop, the godfathers they say, and yet some people don't know, and then they should be a household name. And so being able to, give them this platform is is like raising the tide for all boats you know and we have to do that we have to come together and remember that we all stand on the shoulders of greatness like i said earlier there's so much to be proud of but there's so much we can carry each other and my hashtag is you know um use your power for good like if i were a hashtag that would be it or or maybe you know black women who lift as they climb because we can't we're not in this it's not a solo ride you know we're all in this together mm -hmm. somebody helped you along the way and the same people that you step on toes on the way up are going to be the ones you're going to have to kiss on the way down so be mindful of how you treat folks always 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 lead with kindness and that is my motto in life anyway and so you know when someone says oh well you know you don't need this or you don't need that so and so is not important i'm like no there's no hierarchy because everybody has a blessing and every blessing comes together to make a great gift you know right. we had a lot of wonderful hands that touched our film and and it has been inspired from the great work of 50 years ago. So in a way, we're just continuing the story. You know, it's a, mm. in the film, Ellis Hazel says, black seeds keep on growing, right? And we know that that's actually a, a line from, um, you know, a great song from the 70s, uh, black seeds keep on growing by the main ingredient, uh, the father of Cuba Gooding, by the way, Cuba Gooding Sr. But, you know, it's so, it's so true because we do, we do drop seeds and we have to look to our ancestors who planted those seeds and we have to carry those seeds and we have to keep going mm -hmm. and keep seeding and watering and seeding and watering and seeding and watering. And that's how we grow. And that's how our greatness multiplies. Yeah. We're like the rose that grew from the concrete rest in peace Tupac Shakur. And now with soul, yes. when it came out in 68, I believe, was it a tough sell for NET to get it on the air because it was during the time where there was no content directly aimed at the African-American demographic? Absolutely. And that's why it's so poignant to be having this interview on Martin Luther King Day because, but Seoul responded to the assassination of King and the way our nation was responding and our black nation was mourning and grieving and rising up against you know, the oppression and what that represented. And there were so many uh, uprisings in 1968 responding to, you know, this, ter this trauma and, and needing to make change in the world. And so that's when, you know, this type of black power television emerged as a, as a response to that. And the Kerner Commission, which said we are leading two, two, two worlds, you know, one black and one white, and the media is largely responsible for this. And so this idea of giving a platform to black voices that had never existed before was really empowering and it was liberating. But to take that position and to take that platform and take it one step further and push it and make it unapologetically black, that's what they weren't expecting. You know, because Seoul was, not only was it a platform for, uh, well, it was a vehicle for African-American artistry because he had all these great artists on, but it was also a platform 
for political expression and the fight for social justice. And that was not something that we knew. That was not something that existed on television. And you know, you were used to seeing people of color as maids or you know, subservient positions or all of the protests that you saw, the criminality of blackness in the news. And Ellis Hazel said, no, there's a renaissance going on. We need to show the beauty of black life, black love, black sister and brotherhood, black power, you know, black strength and black diversity. And, and that was really, really important. And it really changed the face of television. Right. And I remember the first episode of Soul I saw was online on YouTube. It was with Bill Withers uh, and Nikki Giovanni. And I was just oh. looking, I was like, oh man, you know you're sitting on history right here. And because of the technological limitations of the day, they probably wiped over a lot of episodes and some were available so on Pentascope. And it was very delicate to film. So what is preserved yeah. is are considered landmarks and treasures that you get to see acts that will later become future stars or hear people that will become future stars express their truth and be unapologetically black it is so true and it really is a treasure trove and it's also a time capsule because you get to see this moment that is so perfectly and sort of unashamedly um preserved in a way and they didn't feel like they were doing that they just were being real at the time and there's a genuine quality in this because it was for us for us by us and that was a type of show that hadn't existed this idea of black creativity behind the camera you know being in charge of the message and being in charge of the image and saying this is who we are we're not being defined by another person's gaze or another person's definition of us. And that's why you see all this varying degrees of talent from Al Green, Earth, Wind and Fire, Nikki Giovanni interviewing James Baldwin. And that clip has gone viral, it's all over Instagram. Well, that was on Soul, you know, in 1971. And it was absolutely groundbreaking mm -hmm. to have like these two black literary icons. At the time you wouldn't see them, you would just be able to read their books. But to see them, this idea of being seen, that's what Soul did. Right. And I think that Ellis Hayslip it's and Don Cornelius, they were on the same wavelength with Black creativity and showing a positive Im image because Don, three years later after Soul, would create Soul Train. So it was definitely That's the right. birth of the idea of we're going to own our content. We're going to show the yep. messages we want to be portrayed. And we're not going to mm -hmm. apologize for being our authentic selves. So love it or that leave it. So true. <laughs> you got it. You got that right. Because Soul uh, did appear on television three years before Soul Train. Most people don't know that. And they think, you know, you think back in time and you think Soul Train, we all grew up with Soul Train on Saturday mornings, learning our dance moves, doing Soul Train line. But this idea that something paved the way for Soul Train, that's important too. And it was Ellis Hazel who was friends with Don Cornelius, literally good friends. And he knew all, because he knew all the black DJs all over the country and he knew all the people in music and the arts and so he said to Don you know you need to bring your show which was a radio show at the time in Chicago bring it to television find a way to make that work the difference is that Soul Train was owned by Don Cornelius but also the artists were lip syncing on Soul Train as opposed to being live on Soul and so it was the success of Soul that gave Soul Train an opportunity. And I really wish we could have interviewed Mr. Cornelius. Unfortunately, he joined the ancestors before he had a, ch a chance to do that. But we know he would have said that because that was a story between them. You know, we think that they're competitors and they're not. They were friends and they were lifting each other up. You know, Ella said, look what I did, man, brother, you can do this too and take it one step further and make your brand. And that's exactly what happened. And it became the hippest trip in America and is still yes. being revered and loved to this day. Now, what were some interesting things that you found out about your uncle during the making of this documentary? I learned so much. I had no idea that he was really involved in Greek life, for example. He knew all the deltas, he knew the AKAs. And so he was really building black institutions at a time when that really wasn't popular. And this idea of taking black culture, the things that we kind of take for granted, you know, the, the ballet, the, the musicals, all the places where our, our art lives, that wasn't believed to be high art and high culture back in the day. And because he was doing a show that was considered, 
a culture show as opposed to a news and public affairs show, he had to work harder to prove that there was value in black culture and to say there's value in R&B. You know, there's value, you know, R&B is the floor of black pride, he said. And there's, and all of this was his passion. Like I knew that he loved artists and he was always pushing them forward and giving them opportunities that they wouldn't have. But I didn't know that outside of that, he was doing the same thing. And he was just such a champion. And he would sit on boards when nobody had black board members. You know, he was the first board member of so many companies. And he helped Alvin Ailey, for example. He was on their board and he helped uh, Bill T. Jones, Arnie Zane, and was on their board and the Scribe Video Center in Philly. And so this idea of building institutions around our art like I said, that we just take for granted now, mm -hmm. that was foundational work for him. Right. And then to see that people all these years later are very passionate about that, like it happened yesterday, that blew me away. And so when right. we were interviewing them and I was worried, oh, how am I gonna make this feel like it's you know fresh and not like an old story? And they mm -hmm. just opened up their hearts to the point of literally crying on camera. And I realized it's right there. It's right at the surface. That's mm -hmm. meaningful, you know, because like they said, it was Maya Angelou who said, people not, might not remember what you said, but they'll always remember how you made them feel. Mm -hmm. And so when Ellis Hayslip, when I hear his stories, it's like he comes to life because I realize what an important person he was to so many people as a, as a person in a relationship. Mm -hmm. And that relationships and careers are built on friendships. And, and that was really, um, you know, because we're in a, uh, an age of celebrity and uh, inaccessibility because of that, you kind of forget that we are all just real people and that it really takes relationships and trust to help move careers forward. And that was really beautiful to learn. Yeah, and without giving too much away, what were some of the struggles that he had to endure behind the scenes during Soul and coming up during that era? Mm -hmm. The biggest struggle, you'd be surprised, was funding. You know, people think that it was only in the fifth year that the show was, was slated to be defunded and canceled. It was supposed to be canceled the first year, but we couldn't make that make the film a story about the cancellation every single year because it just we the show was building and building and getting better and better with bigger artists and better production value and it looked gorgeous so we decided to use the, that as the crisis at the end but the truth was after the first year they didn't have enough money to start again and then after the second year he had to always go out and get funding as if to say y'all black culture matters we need to have this show that kind of was shocking to me to learn that they because they were funded by grants in the first season that that didn't guarantee the second season or the third or the fourth and you look at all the shows that have been on forever the tonight show for example ed sullivan well that's you know back in the day and you're like how did soul have to struggle to survive when it was such an important groundbreaking show with all of the african-american icons of the 20th century you know, it's just mind blowing. Mm -hmm, because if you know PBS, like I know PBS, every show would start off saying that show XYZ is funded by the Corporation of Public Broadcasting or contributions right. from viewers like you. And those pledge right. draws, that's what keeps some of your favorite PBS shows on. That's right. That's right. But they didn't have pledge drives for Soul. And so Ellis Hazel would get on the television um, almost at the end of every show and say, right to Soul, you know please tell us that you love the show. Don't write and give money, but write and say that it's important to see your culture on television. That's what he did. And so in the end, when it was really threatening to go off the air, they received 20,000 handwritten letters. Some of the letters were from people in prison. Some of the letters were from, you know, blacks and whites all over the country. So there's a part in the film where you see the, the letters kept coming in and there's like a graphic of all the letters. I couldn't put 20,000 letters in that graphic, but think about what 20,000 letters in 1972 would mean for emails, you know, today or text, you know, that would be like millions, you know, mm -hmm. it so, was amazing. Yeah. So do you know if the show was only limited to the tri-state area or did it get expanded to no. other PBS affiliates? 
It did, it did. And that happened with the onset of the Public Broadcasting Act. And when the Public Broadcasting Act came into play, that created the PBS system. It had been a bunch of television stations around, public television stations around the country, but they weren't linked together into a system until 1967 when the act was enacted. And then 1968 was when it actually went into play. And then that happened in 1969. So in 1969, then finally you had the PBS system in place. And so that's how the shows went out. So the first year it was a local show from 68 to 69. And then in 1969, when the PBS was in play, it was nationally across the country, all the major places. Now, sometimes stations wouldn't air the show because they thought it was too black or too controversial or too, you know, too black, too strong, as, <laughs> as Chuck D said. Um, and so that, that's why certain uh, markets didn't air it, but that was the choice of the individual television station because it did air in you know New York, all the tri-state area, Philly, West Coast, Midwest, everywhere possible, like 14 largest markets of that time. Mm, but if you know down south, you know they're like, mm, we're not going <laughs> to touch that with a 10 foot pole. 10 foot pole. We want our hee haw. We want our laugh in. We want our stuff to be milk. Now, if you know well, about that milk, laughing, you got milk, that right. Milk with laughing. no chocolate. <laughs> yeah. Well, there is that. You know, when you think about the climate of the era and what Soul represented, because he had Black Panthers on there. Now, remember, the Black Panthers were reviled in the United States by the government, COINTELPRO, everything that they were doing, the same things that they were doing to take down Martin Luther King, which have now been revealed in a new film called MLK FBI by our colleague Sam Pollard. You know, those same uh, tactics were very deliberate, and it was a way to remove Black leadership on the behalf of our own government to you know try to push down the uprising and the and the liberation of black people that's a whole nother conversation to have we'll have to do another podcast on yeah that. De definitely that and oh. i'm gonna go ahead and extend you a open invitation to come back right now and then also i feel so it was a precursor for a little network that was founded by Robert Johnson in Washington, D.C. in 1980. He was a cable industry lobbyist. He was first split in airtime with USA Network and then later got his own airspace, a little network called BET, and also Chuck Johnson out in Oakland for Soul Beat. Right, right. Yeah, and so how exciting is that, that people were like, no, we need to have our own network. And people have often said to me, you know, what if you come back with a show like Soul, but but take it bigger, make it like a Soul channel. Like we need that. And thank goodness for the creatives who are doing that. Thank goodness for Kathy Hughes with TV One. And thank goodness for, you know, everything that's happening with Tyler Perry in Atlanta and his whole studio now. We need to have our own way to get our art out and to get our stories out and to have unapologetic black content for us by us. I think Ellis Hazup knew that, but he was limited by the platform he was on. But still, he really, really set the bar high for black content being unapologetic at that time, even though he wasn't, you know, didn't have ownership over the show. He did have ownership over what he presented as black culture and, and the freedom he gave to artists to express themselves freely. Mm -hmm. That was really key yeah, within was, the confines. Of yeah, that. it wasn't diluted. It was in its purest form. And then as we yeah. see the explosion of hip hop, that our product is worldwide and people want to know mm -hmm. what's in the sauce, what's in the water. We want some of that. It's so true. You know, we have always been the creatives who are making and making taste, taste, taste maker. What's what I'm trying to say? Taste, taste makers. Maker. Influencers. <laughs> influencers the culture you know it's so true it's so obvious and it's so great and i just want to encourage everybody out there who has a dream 
because it's I have a dream day, you know, we have to remember how important Martin was to the liberation of our people. And just because he's no longer with us doesn't mean we can't carry on that legacy. This idea of we all have our own dreams and we all have to push forward and maintain the, that belief. You know, people say, well, it took you so long. Why didn't you give up on your dream? And I've said, well, you know, why would I give up? It's so important. You know, a, a winner is a dreamer who never gives up. Mm -hmm. And th that's, that's, a, that's a phrase from, um, uh, who said that? Um, oh, oh. Oh my gosh. I have to think about that quote where I get that quote from. I'll tell you in a second. <laughs> All right. So how long did it take for the documentary to make? And did you have to go through grants, public funding or private yes. sourcing for the making of this documentary? All public, all public and 10 years it took to make the film. And we went to grants because we knew that the, that the, that the soul show had been funded by grants. And we kind of wanted to have that same for us by us, vibe and make it public and bring the show back to the public and that's why it's so exciting that we're going to be on pbs because that's where the show originated right here out of wnet channel 13 which is the flagship station in new york city but this idea that soul was created for the people by the people on pbs and is coming back to pbs 50 years later that's just so exciting, you know? Yeah. I'm really happy that we're gonna have that opportunity to share the film publicly across the nation. Yeah, it feels like a full circle moment. And for me, being a kid of the 90s, PBS was my go-to to watch shows yeah. as Ghost Rider, Where in the World's Carmen San Diego, Rest in Peace, Big Pen, Newton's Apple, Square One, Mr. Rogers, mm -hmm. Sesame Street, The Usual Suspects. It. It's an important tool to where kids can learn about different things and subjects and not have it feel be boring or you're being talk down to and definitely if you, they have a players drive definitely throw a little coins if you can to help keep the lights on at pbs because contributions from viewers like you are very important so how did that love come you up? For that. yeah and, yeah pbs put my check in the mail so um how <laughs> important was it to have this documentary be told and then prior to linking up with PBS I've read that it's been getting rave reviews from Tribeca Film Festival Rotten Tomatoes it got a high rating and people are just raving saying man we cannot wait for this to come out knowing that there's well you know it's, it's so great we did take the film out uh, um, to as many festivals as we could and then this year um, in August, we released the film in virtual cinemas nationwide because we realized, you know, during the pandemic, there was so much happening. And after uh, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, we really needed to come together as, you know, to feel like we were doing something as part of this struggle and as part of this um, pushback that we really wanted to contribute something beautiful and to say, this is our contribution. This is something that's healing. This is a way of reminding black people of our greatness. And so we released it at a moment of, you know, we were all at home and we were struggling with both the pandemic and the revolution. And we thought, well, this is something that is uplifting and encouraging and re reminds, of, reminds us, like I said, of our greatness and of another time of struggle and revolution. And so why not look to that voice and those people and have that example for us moving forward. And right. so it was really, really wonderful to release the film nationwide. It's still streaming on our um, website. So we have 25 virtual cinema partners and you can just click on website, mrsoulmovie.com and you can stream the film yourself. And it's just really exciting to share that and to know when you do click on any one of those cinema partners that you're supporting that cinema that has its doors closed because of the pandemic, but you're also directly supporting, you know, the half of your, um, your ticket also supports independent filmmakers such as myself and black women independent filmmakers, which don't, we don't always get the love. So mm. it was a really great opportunity and a new way of envisioning getting our um, content out there. Mm -hmm. And your thoughts on the rise of Miss Ava DuVernay? 
Oh my goodness. That's my girl. I love Ava. I've supported her since jump. I think what she's doing is so important. You know, she has taken the game to a new level, but she's always bringing up emerging filmmakers with her and also supporting black women. And with her show, you know, it's so incredible. Queen Sugar, she hires all women directors all the time and women of color. And that is just normal. It's not special. People think of it as special because it hasn't been done, but it's normal and it should be the way it should be in terms of, you know, empowering women and giving them a platform. And that is so extraordinary that she uses her platform for good in that way and is doing some wonderful work and has become, you know, an icon. And for those of us who've known her since we were old friends, it's just so inspiring to see that. Right. And I'm thinking about the Malcolm X movie because of the whole community aspect with African American mm -hmm. films and how it's, yeah pull somebody up and you need a little help along the way. I read in interviews that Spike Lee was saying how the movie was about to run low on funds and he went to some of the big heavy hitters within different sectors, whether it's arts, entertainment, sports, to get some more funds to help finish funding Malcolm yeah. X. Because when I think about Spike Lee and his work, it was unapologetically Black and mm -hmm. art a revolution and the birth for future filmmakers to come say, hey, if he could do do the right thing, Jungle Fever or Mo' Better Blues, then maybe I could do the next great movie too. It's so key. And what's so great about Spike is his vision and his determination has never wavered. And he's been independent from the beginning, you know, with She's Gotta Have It, funding that on his credit cards, maxing out his credit cards when nobody knew who he was and really didn't believe in him, but he always had that vision and he never stopped to, to receive any type of validation and he didn't wait. He didn't wait for permission. That's another thing that Ava DuVernay has emphasized in her, you know, messaging from the beginning is don't wait. You don't need to wait to be approved or to get permission to do something. But if you wait too long, someone else is either going to have your idea or you're going to miss your opportunity. And so this idea of black people taking their own fate into their hands and, and having our own agency in, in what we create, that is, is revolutionary for our time as well. It's also liberating for us mm -hmm. to realize that we don't need permission. Yes, we may need funding, <laughs> that's for sure. But this, this sort of self-preservation mode that we need to be in as artists to preserve our souls, to pre preserve our vision, and to pre preserve our place and make a place for ourselves right. in, the, in the zeitgeist and in the industry. And to demand, that, to demand that place. Mm -hmm. Demand your place. And I mentioned John yeah. Singleton as well, but I'll also be remiss if I oh, did not mention, peace. yes, rest in peace, John Singleton, but I'll be remiss if I did not mention the impact of Robert Townsend and Keenan Ivory oh. Wayans. Yes, Robert Townsend. Are you kidding me? And I'm going to get you, sucka. And everything, I have such respect and such love for the folks who maybe came slightly before the digital era, you know, now we can share everything and push pixels around so quickly, but we have to remember the folks that put it down and who were grinding hard, you know, before everything was as accessible as it is now, digitally and virtually. It's really important to remember folks like that. Frank's Place, you know, all Henry. these shows. Yes, yes, all of it. It's so key, so yeah. key. But, yeah. I agree, because if you look at Hollywood Shelf for what Robert Townsend was able to do, the same stuff that was talked about in the movie, you still see mm -hmm. going on today when you make your rounds in the audition circles. If you're us in Hollywood and to see that yeah. it's still revered and well-loved and also Five Heartbeats is a cultural classic. Yes, and then yeah. Keenan Ivory with In Living Color and everybody Living that Color. spawned off of that show and how they yeah. were able to get away with stuff that you definitely couldn't get away with now, but how it was revolutionary to see, we're going to put this sketch comedy show on a little network 
and we're going to be unapologetically ourselves. We're going to have the best writers in the room. We're going to have mm -hmm. the best actors, actresses, comedians that's going to be future stars and dancers. And we're going to make you come to us and not the other way around. That's right. And look how In Living Color was a platform for people like Jim Carrey and Jennifer Lopez, you know, and, and all of the artists and Jamie Foxx, you know, we think about those were people we fell in love with as like what we thought were smaller players, but it was really just giving a, a national platform to extraordinary talent. And, you know, that's just so incredible. We can't, you can't underestimate what, what that show and what the weigh-ins have done for Black entertainment and entertainment in general. Right. And then also on the, in front of the camera side of things, I look at Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy's impact was huge. I mean, blew up on SNL, became a mm -hmm. big movie star. And he was the last mm -hmm. of the old school studio system where if you notice, all of his movies were on Paramount. That's right. That's right. Because at the time, you know, sometimes artists had to be beholden to a contract it almost goes back to like the 50s when a studio would buy you as a talent and then you would belong to the studio and have to fulfill your contract of deals. It's similar today, but it's, there's a lot more autonomy. And so someone can have like a all over deal like Lena Waithe and all over deal at Amazon and you know she can just do whatever she wants. Or you know there are many different artists who might sign on based on their success to a certain number of projects. But there's so much more autonomy now in what you can create. And that's what's very exciting is this idea that we are all independent artists and we have a vision and to that we can connect with studios that will, you know, align with that vision. That's the key. Mm -hmm. And the internet has leveled the playing field because back then you had to go to a lawyer or look up a legal profession book to understand contract terms. And yeah. forever in perpetuity means that if you sign that contract, they can own whatever it is that you have and not have to give for your consent. Just look at Dave Chappelle's stand up that he did where oh, he was talking about God. how he got a raw deal when he signed the Comedy Central contract with for Chappelle's oh, yeah. show and how Prince was trying to tell everybody own your stuff. Be own ownership is key. It is so key. And, and I just learned a little behind the scenes about the Dave Chappelle show. You know, we only see what is given to us sometimes in the press and this idea that his show was being taken down at his discretion. You have to recognize that we're just hearing, you know, a, a, scratching the surface of the story and the idea that he may have created something that was so powerful. And when he stepped away from the business, the fact that they kept running that show without paying him was something that he needed to reckon with. And luckily the studios did reckon with him, but it shows his tenacity in a, and, and being able to stand up and say, that's my content. I created that and I should be in charge of that and be compensated for it. It's pretty basic, but this is a story that's been going on for a very long time going all the way back to, you know, the early days of music and little Richard, who would always say, you know, I wrote that, <laughs> uh, you know, the idea of Elvis Presley appropriating songs from, you know, the black um, blues singers. And there's been a lot of appropriation of the culture. And it's, it's so exciting that now people are realizing what well, we've realized for a long time, but perhaps we're in a better position to say, you know what, this is our culture and this is our content and we are the creators of it and we will be the custodians. We will be the guardians of that and we will share that appropriately. But what we, you must, you got to recognize the source and honor the source. Mm -hmm. Yep. Don't take the money on the front end, eat off the back end because Jason Weaver told a story um, with DJ Vlad about how when he was negotiating his contract for the Lion King, his mom mm -hmm. with him since he was under 18 and how Disney just wanted to give them the upfront money. But mom was like, uh, we gonna eat off the back end. <laughs> Go ahead, mom. You gotta love the stage mom because she knew, you know, she totally knew. And, and the thing is that we don't, all, we're not always taught this sort of financial literacy you know mm -hmm. we 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 want to arrive at on these levels and and be in the room where it happens as the saying goes you know speaking of um 
of our dude from from Hamilton. Um, but we have to recognize that it's so much more than that, that there is a level of ownership, dignity, and all of that has to come into play so that we can protect our own copyrights, our own intellectual property, our own own our own masters. You know, so interesting in our film because we had so much music and it was really rights heavy and we had to license all of the music. So here I was thinking, oh, Ellis Hazelf had a great relationship with all these artists. It's not gonna be a problem. Realizing that the artists don't own the masters, that the masters are owned by the publishers. And so few black artists have been able to hold on to their publishing. And so that was a, that was a real learning curve for me too. And, and understanding how, what a struggle there has been. I remember when we were interviewing the great late um, Billy Taylor, Dr. Billy Taylor, who was a wonderful pianist, jazz pianist, who used to run the Kennedy Center for Jazz um, at the Kennedy Center. And um, I was interviewing him. He's also my cousin, so I know him very well. And he wrote the film, he wrote, sorry, he wrote the music, I Wish I Knew How It Would Feel to Be Free. And that's important to say today because that was, um, Martin Luther King's favorite song, and he would often play it for Martin Luther King before Martin went on into his rallies and, and marches, uh, because they were very, very close. And when I interviewed Billy Taylor and I said, I would love for you to play that and we'll use it in the film. And he sat down at the piano and started improvising and I said, no, 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 don't play anything we can't afford. Just play the song so I know we can license. And he turned to me and he said, Melissa, I own this. I own this song. I own my masters. And I was just blown away because I said, I didn't expect that. I, I always thought that all the other Black artists from the early 40s, 50s, 60s didn't own their masters. He said, no, I, was, I knew what to do from the beginning. And it's really wild if you read the... Um, uh, if you read some of the later work and there's a biography by Quincy Jones and in it, he quotes Billy Taylor and says, you know, I learned everything about my business from Billy Taylor, who taught me that it was important to be a businessman when it came to your music and your publishing and your masters. Mm -hmm. And he said, I owe everything. You could look it up. It's in the, it's in the biography, the autobiography of Quincy Jones. He says, I learned everything about music business and being a business with my art from Billy Taylor. And that was just so wild to me because mm -hmm. you realize that artists coming up where everybody wants that prize. Everyone wants the fame, the fortune and all the swag. And, and, but the thing is we're not taught financial literacy and how to plan to, to be owners of our own content and our own, um, intellectual property. Right. Don't sell out your publishing for a Cadillac and a paper bag full of cash. Now, Sam hey. Cooke was on that route with uh, <laughs> owning his publishing and saying, you're yeah. not going to play me. I'm going to make all this money off this song and you're not going to give me a fraction of a penny. How do you split a fraction of a penny? It's beyond. Isn't that something? Just to, can you imagine the difficulty he must have had because of the times we were living in and the, and the time being a black man and being able to assert yourself and say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to entertain you, but I'm also going to take that money from that entertainment. You know, those were two separate things. There was so much Jim Crow happening and, and, you know, Harry Belafonte not being able to swim in the pool or, uh, you know, Sammy Davis Jr. not being able to stay in the hotel where he's performing. That was real. And we still persevered. We still, rose and still I rise as the poem says and it's just remarkable I think on this Martin Luther King Day you know this idea of black excellence is so perfect themed for today because we still rise we keep rising right and we will rise and we will rise and still I rise and I think it's remarkable we've been through so much and yet we have this idea that we can get further and even James Baldwin says that in our film there's a clip where he's talking with with um Nikki Giovanni, and he says, um, you know, we have, we have been through something, you know, we, black people have been through the hardest game in the world. I don't know how we did it, but we did it. And if we can get this far, we can get further. And mm -hmm. I just love, it gives me chills every time I hear that. 
And I, I've interpreted it differently over the years, but this summer, it really impacted, it really hit different, as they say, it hit different. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, you know, he's saying, if we get this far, we can get further. We've been through the toughest game in the world. And I had never really associated that with, you know, slavery. Mm -hmm. And yet here we are yeah. creating mm -hmm. and, and excelling and being great. And so every day I wake up and I'm like, how can I be great today? Even if it's a small thing, right. <laughs> if I send an email, I sent that email, I'm great. You know, we have to keep reminding ourselves of our greatness. And that's what Mr. Soul, the movie does. Right. Because when I think about the forefathers and everybody that came before and everybody that's out doing what they're doing now, it's like a baton race where one person mm -hmm. starts off, you pass the baton to the next and so on and so right. forth. You're going to get to the finish line, but you just got to keep passing that baton. Keep the race going. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Each one teach one. Yeah. Right. And you mentioned Harry Belafonte earlier. There's a good documentary that if you have not seen it on Peacock, you should definitely check it out. It's called The Sit-In, about what he did a week stint on The Tonight Show. He got to pick the artist, the guest, and Carson, he had the foresight to say, I'm not competent enough to talk about these issues. I'm going to get somebody who can, even though on the outside, you would think he will be very conservative because, you know, he's from the Midwest, but he was understanding of the issues of the day and had the foresight to let Harry Belafonte do that. That's so right. It's a great documentary by my girl, Yorba Richin, and she has another film coming out called uh, um, How It Feels to Be Free, which I think, I'm not sure, but it sounds like it's the other half of that title. I wish I knew how it would feel to be free by my cousin, Billy Taylor. But yes, so sh that film's coming out tonight and that's about black women and, and extraordinary black women entertainers as well. So try to check both of those out. I always got to give shout out to, to, my, to my peeps out here and, and, and the, especially my black women directors. All right. I got to support everybody. All right, so like I stated at the top, Mr. Soul is going to be dropping on PBS on February the 22nd on Independent Lens. You can catch it right now on the virtual cinemas. Just go to give them the website. www.mrsoulmovie.com. Check it out there. Mm -hmm. Or you can wait until the Independent Lens drops on PBS. And do you have any other shout outs you want to give before we wrap? Yeah, I want to make sure everyone follows us. Shout out to social media because we have a lot of friends out there and want to make sure everybody um, hits us up, you know, come through our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at Mr. Soul the Movie. And just want to shout out uh, Black Public Media, who's really been supportive of us and all of our funders. And um, especially want to shout out the Black women who have helped put Mr. Soul together on this day of remembrance. Um, so I want to shout out Chaz Ebert and um, just some wonderful folks who are put the film together and also our incredible executive producers, Stan Lathan, who was an original director on Soul, and Blair Underwood, who is the voice of Ellis Hazlip in our film and also an executive producer on Soul. So hope you all can check it out and, uh, you know, come through on the gram. We're on there every day and spread the word about the film. That's really important, too, because we are all a family. We got to got to get the word out there and appreciate you, brother, for having us on the show today. Oh, not a problem. And Stan Lathan, that's Sanaa Lathan's dad, for those of you that yes. do not know. Sanaa and Lathan's dad. Yes. yes. And, and He's actually the, one of the first directors on Soul. And some of the greatest episodes you see were directed by Stan Lathan, like Earth, Wind & Fire episode, the Stevie Wonder episode. You know, that's all Stan Lathan's work. So it's exciting to have him back on the, on the film as our executive producer as well. Wow. And then I was also looking at the end credits and I saw Anna Marie Horsford, who would later go on to be on Amen and play as D on the Waynes Brothers. I was like, whoa, she was putting in work since then. Yes, she was. She was a, the first associate producer on Soul. And Ellis Hazlip knew her as a dear friend and in, really encouraged her to become an actress because she started out working uh, behind the scenes as a crew, a crew member. And he's like, what do you want to do? She said, I want to be an actress and a poet. And he said, okay, let's put you on the show. 
And people don't even realize that that's where she got her start. And she was best friends with Ellis until he passed. So yeah, mm, Anna Maria Horst. Yeah, and she you can. In the film as well. Yeah, and you can go to pbs.org to check to see what time Soul will be airing on the 22nd of February on Independent Lens. You can catch this interview of, on all streaming platforms, Anchor, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, wherever you stream your podcast, and the video portion will be available on the YouTube channel of the same name. Just search Beyond the Album Cover. Thank you, everybody, for your support. Ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, Miss Melissa Hazlip on Beyond the Album Cover. Thank you for coming on and doing this interview. Hey, thank you, brother. It's been so wonderful and peace and blessings. Stay safe, mask up, and I hope you have a wonderful Martin Luther King Day and beyond. Thank you.